Hey everybody, we're going to talk today about the modern world. So I want you to kind of think a moment for when you were born and think about some of the huge events that have made the news since you were born. So most of you were born before 9-11, but that's definitely has shaped a lot of your lives. You also have experienced school shootings and different things that have definitely changed your lives. I remember when um, I was was teaching, uh, since I have been teaching, this is my 22nd year of teaching, that 9-11 has happened, Columbine has happened, a lot of things. Also, the way that the technology has changed. Uh, think about how that uh, when I was, my first cell phone was in 1997, and it was what people often call the brick. And thinking that now my cell phone is a mini computer. So we call this time period the modern world, and that's our last um, major SOL that we have to cover. We still have one more unit that you'll do after this, but this is our, our last big unit. So this is a great video. Um, interesting fact, Miss Nash actually knows all of the lyrics to this song. And this song was actually done in the late 80s. And um, Billy Joel, We Didn't Start the Fire, he basically goes through all these kind of major important events of the uh, 20th century. And so it's just kind of neat. Um, and if you get a chance, you can listen to that. So when we think about the modern world, there's a lot of problems that are facing the modern world. And so we have to think about, uh, you know, what has changed, all those things that are part of that. Globalization increases in that, increasing in people having market economies, capitalism, the growth of democratization or, or growth of democracy. It's called democratization, which is the growth of democracy that we see around the world. Our population has increased uh, tremendously. China and India have the two largest populations in the world with over a billion people. We have the third largest population in the world, which is 330 million, which that's a a big difference there. And we're talking about about 8 million people on our planet. So when we think about how uh, people move in the world today, kind of our biggest way that people are moving is related to refugees and migration. So refugees are people who are leaving their home because there is a conflict. And it has to be that they are being persecuted and there's some kind of international conflict uh, conflict happening in their country. So for example, right now, the most famous group of refugees are the Syrian refugees because there's a civil war going on in Syria. And if you have access to uh, the web page, there will be information there about the Syrian civil war so you get a little bit of idea of why that's happening. We're also going to do an activity about refugees because that has been such a big part of our modern world. The United Nations, which remember was formed after World War II, works to try to find homes for refugees. So many of you know that I lived overseas. And so when I taught in Turkey, I actually had several refugee students. And so I had students who were refugees from Iran and from Iraq, and they came to Turkey to escape what was happening in their countries. And so when they came there, the Turkish government placed them um, in, in cities in the, there, and they were allowed to get education. Now, these families uh, had then applied with the United Nations because they wanted to be able to get a permanent home and they wanted to come to America. So, for example, I taught three sisters who were from Iraq, and they're all living in the United States today. And one of them, I got to go to her citizenship ceremony a few years ago where she became a U.S. citizen. But they worked through the United Nations, and when they came to the United States, they were given money to help them settle and start, basically like being on uh, Social Security or uh, food stamps, those kind of things, until they can get settled and get a job. There's programs that help them with languages and such like that. And the United States is not the only country that takes refugees. They also take refugees um, in mo many places in Europe and also in um, Canada and lots of other places. There's another group of people which we call migrants or guest workers. And these are people who come from poor areas who are economically don't have a lot of money and they're looking for um, ways to get better jobs. So I'll give you an example. 
Uh, many of you have heard of the city of Dubai, which is in the United Arab Emirates. 80% of the people who live in Dubai are not from that country. And a lot of them are actually Indian and Pakistani who have moved there in order to, to get a job. So what does it mean to be a refugee? Um, we're gonna watch this little video because this is a great information about what it means to be a refugee. Around the globe, there are approximately 60 million people who have been forced to leave their homes to escape war, violence, and persecution. The majority of them have become internally displaced persons, which means they have fled their homes but are still within their own countries. Others have crossed a border and sought shelter outside of their own countries. They are commonly referred to as refugees. But what exactly does that term mean? The world has known refugees for millennia, but the modern definition was drafted in the UN's 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees in response to mass persecutions and displacements of the Second World War. It defines a refugee as someone who is outside their country of nationality and is unable to return to their home country because of well-founded fears of being persecuted. That persecution may be due to their race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion, and is often related to war and violence. Today, roughly half the world's refugees are children, some of them unaccompanied by an adult, a situation that makes them especially vulnerable to child labor or sexual exploitation. Each refugee's story is different, and many must undergo dangerous journeys with uncertain outcomes. But before we get to what their journeys involve, let's clear one thing up. There's a lot of confusion regarding the difference between the terms migrant and refugee. Migrants usually refers to people who leave their country for reasons not related to persecution, such as searching for better economic opportunities or leaving drought-stricken areas in search of better circumstances. There are many people around the world who have been displaced because of natural disasters, food insecurities, and other hardships. But international law, rightly or wrongly, only recognizes those fleeing conflict and violence as refugees. So what happens when someone flees their country? Most refugee journeys are long and perilous, with limited access to shelter, water, or food. Since the departure can be sudden and unexpected, belongings might be left behind, and people who are evading conflict often do not have the required documents like visas to board airplanes and legally enter other countries. Financial and political factors can also prevent them from traveling by standard routes. This means they can usually only travel by land or sea and may need to entrust their lives to smugglers to help them cross borders. Whereas some people seek safety with their families, others attempt passage alone and leave their loved ones behind with the hopes of being reunited later. This separation can be traumatic and unbearably long. While more than half the world's refugees are in cities, sometimes the first stop for a person fleeing conflict is a refugee camp, usually run by the United Nations Refugee Agency or local governments. Refugee camps are intended to be temporary structures, offering short-term shelter until inhabitants can safely return home, be integrated to the host country, or resettle in another country. But resettlement and long-term integration options are often limited. So many refugees are left with no choice but to remain in camps for years and sometimes even decades. Once in a new country, the first legal step for a displaced person is to apply for asylum. At this point, they're an asylum seeker and not officially recognized as... Okay, so I'm going to stop this here as um, I kind of already have alluded to what happens once you actually become an asylum seeker. But it gives us a little bit of a better, better idea. So there's been a lot of history of uh, conflicts, ethnic and religious conflicts, and we've seen a rise of ethnic and religious conflicts in the world. So the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, centers around the Israel-Palestine area in uh, the Middle East. And 
The reason this conflict begins goes back a long time, but the after World War II, the Jews needed a homeland and they wanted to return to their original homeland that they had, many of them had left. The problem was is that there were already Arab people living there. And the United Nations tried to come up with a agreement of creating the nations of Israel and Palestine. However, none of the Arab nations agreed to this. And people just started arriving in Israel. Then once Israel became a nation, all of its surrounding neighbors, which were all Arab nations, declared war on them. Israel won the war, and they not only defeated the Arabs around them, but they also took a lot of land. They were aided by the United States, who had aided their formation. Today, there's still conflict about the borders. Palestine is officially still under Israeli control and is not a recognized uh, country. And so that is where a lot of that conflict still stems from today. There's also the Kurds, which are a native people who live in Iraq, Iran, and Turkey. They would like to have their own country. They would like to be called Kurdistan, land of the Kurds, but they're not super organized. So that's part of the problem. Also, Iraq, Iran, and Turkey, none of them want to give up the land that they, that they, um, they live in. Uh, they're pretty persecuted. Uh, they, three million of them were killed by Saddam Hussein when he was ruling Iraq. And that is a genocide of the Kurds in that time period. Uh, the Turkish people do not give uh, rights to the Kurds. One of the most active terrorist groups in Turkey is actually the Kurdish Workers' Party, which has uh, wants more freedom. And so many of them have left their area, but the Kurds is a, is a big issue as well. Not only do we see in the Middle East, <clears throat> but there are also religious conflicts, for example, in um in ireland there is conflicts between the irish and in the irish there's catholics versus protestants and so northern ireland which is predominantly protestant is with the united kingdom which is england scotland wales and then the republic of ireland is officially catholic but they had to fight for this and there's still um it's been really good in the last couple of years and i would even say maybe the last two decades but there was some pretty violent fighting and terrorist activities in the 80s by the Irish Republic Army, which wanted to reunify Ireland and uh, England has really fought to protect Northern Ireland. There's also Yugoslavia, which uh, former Yugoslavia, the areas of the Balkan Peninsula. And there's several religious groups in that area, Muslim, Catholics, uh, and then Greek Orthodox. And they fought over territory. It got so bad, there actually was a genocide, which you're gonna learn about, in uh, with Kosovo and the Bosnians that happened in um, the United Nations and the U.S. stepped in to help and intervene on behalf of the Muslims who had been victims of uh, attacks by Christian groups. So you can see here, this is that region of the world. And so there was a, in the 90s, there was another genocide there. The Horn of Africa. So the Horn of Africa is this area right here. And this is an area that um, has seen a lot of conflict as well. And specifically here, like in South Sudan and the Darfur region, this is again, Christians versus Muslims. So this is another, the Darfur is another genocide that has happened. In Rwanda, there was another genocide between the Hutus and Tutsis. Our last unit is gonna be on genocides. And so there continues to be a lot of racial tensions between tribes. Remember that when the Europeans left Africa, they drew the borders of the countries without any consideration for how it affected the tribes there. And so there's a lot of conflict between those groups of people. There's also continues to be conflicts between Hindus and Muslims in India and Pakistan. Pakistan and India hate each other so much, they don't even uh, have the same time. Like their time zone should be the same on the border there and they have a 15 minute difference because they don't even like each other so much. They both have nuclear weapons which are pointed toward each other. Could could end up being very bad. There's also ethnic conflicts in Indonesia, also in Myanmar. Some of it's ethnic, some of it's religious. And so we've seen an increase in these types of conflicts in the 20th century. So I've talked about so far, we've seen an increase in democracies an increase in capitalism. We've also seen an increase in globalization and an increase in a rise of ethnic and religious conflicts. So when we think about technology and science, um, it is a big part of the modern area. 
and there is an unequal access that was a big problem. While that a lot of people, a lot more people have access to computers and we can talk to each other through all kinds of amazing virtual meetings like Zoom and Skype and Teams and WhatsApp and all of these different things connect us. It's not available for everyone. There's also been scientific issues like genetic engineering and bioethics. Um, you guys have probably never heard of Dolly, but when I was um, younger, there was, they tried to clone a sheep and they actually were successful and Dolly was the first cloned sheep. And there was a lot of discussion about the ethics of that. Uh, were we playing God by cloning animals? And so it stopped as a result of that. And so there's a lot of what we call bioethics, which are the ethics regarding anything uh, related to science. And so is it ethical? Are we playing God? Is it okay to do these things? And this is a, like, for example, when uh, the stem cells that are available in fetuses, like they can do amazing things. And there's a lot of debate about how ethical it is to use those. So we're talking about countries, we're looking at developing and developed countries and how they are different. So when you're thinking about developed and developing countries, like what's the difference? So the United States, that should be your example of a developed country. So a developed country um, is someone who has a high literacy rate. We're looking at economic development, all those kind of things. We would historically have called these first world countries. So the United States, Canada, Australia, almost all of Europe. When we start thinking about developing countries, these are the poorer countries of the world. Uh, much of Latin America, uh, almost all of Africa, a lot of the Middle East, a lot of Asia. For example, South Africa is considered to be the only developing co developed country in Africa. Turkey is considered to be the only developed country in the Middle East. So we're gonna look at a comparison between um, countries here in just a minute. And so when we look at these, developed nations tend to have more sophisticated goods. Everyone has access to all the following. For example, I was talking to a student who used to live in Nigeria this past week. And when I asked him, you know, what do you like better about America over Nigeria? And one of the things he said was running water and consistent electricity. Like those are things that we take for granted, but they're not everywhere in the world. Medical care, like what is your access to doctors? How many uh, people are there for every doctor? Do you have advanced industries or are you still just a farming company? Do you have high educational standards? Uh, what is your birth rate for every 1,000 children that are born? How many die? Those are all things that we look at. So developing nations still, still tend to do developing uh, farming, kind of basic things. They don't have what we call specialized industries. Uh, they have lower standards of living, make lower wages. They um, have higher infant mortality rate. They do not have uh, a very good literacy rate, like who can read and write. And they're not able to kind of take care of things after natural disasters. Like think about Haiti, how they had so much trouble after they had, you know, hurricane versus like Louisiana cleaning up after a tornado. So natural disasters are a big role in that. And so I've given you examples. I figure most of us were familiar with Haiti, which of course is a island nation that's just off the coast of um, Florida down in the Caribbean. So if you look at the United States, our gross domestic product, like what our country is worth, it's 19.6 trillion. We have the highest in the world. We're constantly competing with China to be number one and number two. They only have 19.8 billion. GDP per capita, this is what the average person makes. So the average person in America, and I keep in mind, we're averaging Bill Gates and Oprah Winfrey and all those people, is $60,000 in the United States. And in Haiti, it's only 1,800. In places in Nigeria, people live on $2 a day. This is just the abject poverty. What percent of your population is under 15? You, you wanna have what we call a healthy population pyramid where it's kind of spread out. And so Haiti is a lot more, a third of their country is under the age of 15. And that's going to be a problem for them. Life expectancy, it's 80 in the United States, 64. They are some places in Africa, it's in the 50s. Infant mortality rate, for every 1,000 live births in the United States, six die. It's 47 in Haiti. And then literacy rate, 99% of the people who are 15 or older can read or write 
read and write in America, and it's only 61% in Haiti. Urbanization, what percent is urbanized? Has cities, 82%. So to be a developed nation, we want that to be at least two thirds. With, not only with developing, develop, developing countries really struggle with pollution. I'm sure you may have noticed, thanks to the COVID virus, that we actually have a lot of cleaner air. Like for example, that we don't have as many non-essential businesses going. And so the environment is actually doing a lot better. We are not having as much input in pollution. All this affects the, the global climate. We've seen global warming. We've seen all, all of these things, um, how that the use of natural resources, burning coal and oil and all those things, how they impact our environment. We even um, have the ozone layer, you know, which surrounds the, the world, the depletion of that, which releases more and more, um, you know, that, that's part of the people believe the effect into global warming. Loss of habitats has deforestation. As we go more and build more, we take away natural habitats of animals. And there's a lot of debates about this. Like, for example, uh, there are places in the Florida Keys that we could get oil, uh, but we would be destroying the natural habitats there. So you have to decide and balance those things. Social challenges, these are all things that the world is facing. Poverty, poor health, illiteracy, famine, migration. And remember, this is world history, so we're not just talking about the United States, but the problems we're seeing in the world. Okay, as so we've talked a little bit about the kind of the problems. Let's also talk about some of the advantages of having market economies, capitalism. So the relationship between economic and political freedom. The more economic freedom people have, the more political freedom they demand. So this happened in China in the late 80s in Tiananmen Square, students, they had gotten, they had released more capitalism into the communist economy in China. And students is where this started, the protesting, they wanted more rights, more democracy. And so they camped out in Tiananmen Square and the government didn't like it. And they actually started to uh, get rid of people. And we don't even exactly know how many people were killed in Tiananmen Square because the Chinese government uh, wants to cover it up. But on the other hand, in a positive way, South Korea, Taiwan, these are areas, we call them the Asian tigers. So South Korea, Japan, uh, Taiwan, they really built up after World War II economically. And as they got more capitalism and grew econ economically, people demanded more political and democracy rights in the democratic government, and they got it. All these play a role in this. Trade is a big part of this. Uh, we have the North American Free Trade Agreement, which is between the United States, Mexico, and Canada, where we have open trade. And in capitalism, that's one of the things we see, open trade. And the World Trade Organization is involved in that. We have also these international groups like International Monetary Fund, which will help countries that are struggling and will loan countries money to help them get back on their feet. We saw this in Greece, and we've seen this in countries in Asia and also in Africa. So this is just kind of a, a little video that has like all the most important events, like describing kind of events. I'll play this for a little bit, and you could kind of think about, and we're going to end the first part of our session here before I get to talk about some of our other modern day events with what you think is the most important events in modern history. been the most significant historic event in your lifetime. Pew Research recently posed this question to Americans, and some of the results are pretty predictable, but others, they're kind of surprising. Okay, so check it out. Here's the top 10. Let's just get number one out of the way. That's the September 11th attacks. It was ranked first by Americans of all ages. Then you've got those sort of uh, where were you when moments. JFK's assassination, the moon landing, the fall of the Berlin Wall, there are also the wars that Americans have fought in. There's Vietnam, of course, and the more recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. But now look at this. Coming in at number 10 is the recent massacre at an Orlando nightclub. And that's likely because of the influence of millennials. So for this generation, their significant events included three mass shootings, Orlando plus Columbine and Sandy Hook. 
And actually, Americans from each generation mentioned influential events other generations didn't. So Generation X had the Challenger space shuttle disaster. And baby boomers had the civil rights movement. And the silent generation, of course, noted World War II. But okay, back to the overall top 10. Number nine is gay marriage, another recent event that makes the list. At number three, you have the tech revolution, which, like 9-11, has made a big impression on all generations. And finally, the last one, that's the election of Barack Obama as president. In part two, we're going to discuss terrorism, so we will end here for the first part of the modern world.